Um, hi, my name is Andre Robertson Bate, and I'm here from the Ibn Hattery Fellowship. I'm joined by Alina Siegfried, um, who's our content and communication lead. Um, Join us hi briefly. Kia ora, everybody. How's it going? And um, today we have the uh, the pleasure and opportunity to share with you about EHF. So we're going to cover off in a couple of different parts. We're going to start with Alina describing what EHF is, talking about the fellows, talking about living and working in New Zealand. And then after that, I'm going to share a bit about how we select and about our selection process. Our plan is to leave a lot of space for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to add those into the, the Q&A little box. And we'll, we might cover some of them off as we go, but we'll definitely come back to a bunch of them at the end as well. So keep the questions coming and we can keep it interactive. Also, we're recording this call and uh, we plan to share it with some people who registered but weren't able to join or some others that would like to learn more about the fellowship. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Alina. Thank you, Andre. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, really pleased that you could all join us today and learn a little bit more about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, what we are really looking to, to build and achieve with EHF is um, a, a global community of change makers. Um, and the, the, the home base for our um, operations is here in New Zealand, obviously. Um, and so a lot of our fellows will be basing themselves here, but we're looking really to build a global community beyond New Zealand. So there are other ways that fellows can um, contribute from afar or perhaps look at more of a long-term plan to coming to New Zealand as well. So I think at the heart of what we are doing, um, it's, a, it's a fellowship community, more so than an incubator or an accelerator or, or other such programs. Um, as I've said there, that we, we're looking for a, a global community that can really help us um, create impact from New Zealand and ripple throughout the world. Um, we're looking to provide a, a platform and, a, um, I guess, a, um, a place for you to collaborate and grow together. And, and that can happen either as individuals or with the mentorship of our team and our, um, our wider networks, as well as your fellow fellows. Um, tied up within that is a, is a world-class support network. So we're investing a lot in um, developing partnerships with other communities of impact around both New Zealand and the world to be able to support our fellows um, in their work. And lastly, um, really looking um, for our fellows to develop a long-term connection with this country. Um, so to establish some deep roots here, whether that be um, moving yourselves and and or your families here, or whether that be um, you know helping connect uh, New Zealand entrepreneurs and investors and change makers with the rest of the world. So there's a number of ways that you can de develop your connections with this country as well. I'm going to introduce a few of our fellows here because I think that's a fantastic way to really. Um, uh, orient you and give you some examples of the of the profiles of the type of people that we are looking to join this program. Um, Emmeline is one of our cohort one fellows. Um, she's from the Philippines originally and um, is a, essentially an, an international space consultant. So between her and her uh, partner in work and life, um, Eric, the two of them have over 50 years experience in the international space industry. Um, they've helped build up the International Space University. Now, between them, their goal in New Zealand is to build a democratised space ecosystem here. So what that means is essentially making sure that um, the, the benefits of space technology and, and the, um, the applications of it in terms of um, environmental monitoring, in terms of um, remote sensing, and all the other um, sort of positive impact applications of space technology are shared by everyday people and that space is accessible to more and more people. Um, and we're seeing um, definitely a, a trend for that worldwide rather than it being just in the realm of governments and large corporations. So that's, that's their mission is to really make space accessible to the everyday person. Audrey Tan is... Um, Again, one of our Cohort 1 fellows, she has co-founded an organisation called Angels of Impact. 
um, that operates uh, mainly out of Singapore, but across um, the, the whole Southeast Asian region. And what um, her and her co-founders do is they um, they connect angel investors and mentors to um, to primarily women-led ventures in the in the Southeast Asia region. So they work a lot with um, small uh, small to medium businesses, um, micro enterprises, social enterprises, um, and the types of organisations that are really helping to lift women out of poverty and see women as uh, key players in. Um, in, in bringing their communities along with them and um, in, in developing some and commercializing some ideas and, um, and some of the skills that they have. This is Raphael. He is one of our investor fellows um, and he's, um, he's originally from, um, I think uh, he's based himself these days in the Silicon Valley area and um, is looking to really work with um, entrepreneurs that are solving uh, complex problems and that, that are thinking about things a little bit differently. So he, um, he's had a long history with different venture funds, um, is looking now at establishing his own um, organization, his own venture fund here in New Zealand, and, um, and to work with entrepreneurs, as I said, that are, that are really pushing the boundaries um, and, and tackling big complex um, problems of significance to humanity. And this is Alana. She's one of our uh, Kiwi fellows. So in addition to um, international fellows, uh, which will get access to the Global Impact Visa, which um, Andre will tell you a little bit about later on, EHF also accepts um, New Zealanders into the program. And we do that so that um, we, we have some great cross-pollination of ideas. Um, the Kiwi Fellows can help the International Fellows um, hit the ground running in New Zealand and, um, and help orient, it, orient themselves, um, whereas the International Fellows can help the Kiwi Fellows think about taking their work global. So um, again, just coming back to that idea of really creating a, a diverse community that, that can help each other in different ways. So Alana's venture is called A Little Bit Yummy. Um, Drawing on her own uh, personal experiences, um, she has developed a website um, that provides um, advice and recipes for people suffering from irritable bowel syndrome, um, which is a quite a wide um, um, swath of the population, really. There's about, I think, 11% of the global population suffer from some sort of irritable bowel syndrome. So... Um, a, a key thing about her website is that each of her recipes have been approved by a, a dietitian, a registered dietitian. So there's some scientifically backed, um, in, you know, resources going into this um, into this community platform for helping people with um, with a debilitating condition be able to actually live fulfilling, healthy lives. going to talk to you a little bit now about um, what it actually means to be an EHF fellow and what's involved in um, uh, being part of the fellowship. One of the key things um, that we orient ourselves around the year is our New Frontiers summits and cohort retreats. Um, now these happen twice a year. We do a New Frontiers summit and a cohort welcome week every time we accept a new cohort, which is roughly every six months. And New Frontiers is a great um, opportunity to introduce our new fellows to the New Zealand startup ecosystem and the business community. Um, and we, we have a, a very wide range of people attending um, that summit as well from across New Zealand and around the world. Um, it's often a good starting point for people who might be interested in the program if they're able to come to New Zealand and make a New Frontiers summit. That's often um, their first introduction into the EHF community and a chance to talk with people about, you know, what kind of impact New Zealand needs, what kind of projects are going on here. Um, we have regional gatherings as fellows are starting to move into New Zealand. Um, and those are largely fellow driven at this point. So as we see a critical mass of people gathering in, in certain cities, um, fellows are taking it upon themselves to um, have regular meetups or, um, um, you know, give presentations at, at local, um, local startup um, hubs and co-working spaces um, 
and we expect to see that growing more and more around the country as we as we get more and more cohorts of fellows coming through. At the moment, we have pretty active communities in Wellington, Christchurch, um, Auckland. We have a few in Hamilton as well, but we, we expect to see a lot um, more of that happening out in further regional New Zealand as well. Um, because a lot of our fellows are still spread across the world, um, there's, a, there's a, a big component of online connection on here um, and informal collaboration. So th this is very much, you know, part of that is organic as well um, in terms of seeing how the community come together. They, um, they get a chance to, to come together and meet at Welcome Week and a lot of those connections and collaborations get sparked off at that time. Um, a really nice example of that is one of our Cohort 1 fellows, Denise Chapman Weston, who's um, got a long history of um, developing um, sort of entertainment and education-based theme park um, technologies, has, is collaborating with one of our Cohort 2 fellows who's um, looking to make renewable energy much more um, accessible and, and equitable. So they're looking at a collaboration together to um, get renewable energy in a lot of theme parks around, um, around the world. And in terms of the online connection, um, we, we're in this process of building up a, um, a, an online community hub for all things fellow collaboration and, and a bit of a one-stop shop for all things EHF. So that's something that we're working on as well. Um, and throughout all of this, the, the EHF team really looks to support um, however we can with our fellows. As I mentioned before, EHF isn't um, a, an accelerator or an incubator as such. We don't take the, quite the same hands-on approach as some of those types of programs. Um, we're, a, we're a community of support. So that means that the fellows are very much in the driver's seat. Um, in terms of how, how they direct their ventures, their projects and collaborations, and that our team is here to assist um, as and when we're needed to give advice, to uh, make introductions, um, to help, help people in, in whatever may, way makes the most sense. And that will be very much um, on an individual basis. So there's no one way that our team supports. It very much depends on your own situation. Um, here's a few shots just of our um, New Frontiers gatherings. So as you can see, it's, a, it's very much a place where um, you can get to experiment with some new technologies. Um, we have panel discussions, we have um, speaker presentations, our fellows, our new fellows present their work. Um, and we, we invite everybody from, uh, from entrepreneurs and investors through to uh, government officials, um, key artists and musicians, um, educators, farmers, um, and everybody really from all types of industries because the, the most important thing about EHF is that it, uh, we recognize that in order to make and create the type of um, positive change in direction that, that we need across the world, um, everybody is needed on this journey. So everybody's skill sets are gonna be required. A little bit here, um, just outlining what the EHF ecosystem really looks like. And you'll see in the inner circle there is um, the, the core, I guess, elements of, of what's happening around the, the fellowship program. So you've got your fellows, of course. Um, we, we have uh, fellows who have been through the, um, the initial three-year period who then become um, alumni of the program. And, and keep on supporting other fellows. You've got obviously the ventures they're creating. We are um, we're really lucky to be able to partner with Immigration New Zealand on this program. So EHF um, is the fellowship program that provides access to Immigration New Zealand's Global Impact Visa, which is a, a new form of visa. It's, it's sort of custom built for this program and um, represents the, the first um, immigration policy in the world, really, to, to focus on um, assessing people on the kind of positive impact that they can create. And we've got, um, obviously, um, startup teams and investment funds that are supporting those, those um, key areas as well. 
in the wider circle, um, we've got much more of our um, our New Zealand community and and our global community there as well. So we do have good relationships with other incubators, accelerators, and co-working spaces around New Zealand, um, economic development agencies, and, and so on. Um, Callaghan Innovation is New Zealand's government-driven um, innovation arm that supports a lot of research and development. There's a few other government organisations that we work quite closely with. Um, we also work with <coughs> education and, and Crown Research Institutes that are driving a lot of innovation and research and development in New Zealand. And then at a global level, we're, we're always looking to work more with um, global ambassadors of the program, um, leading entrepreneurs who are um, who are really leading work in their fields, um, investors likewise. Uh, we have an independent selection panel for the program who make final decisions. And then the final one I'll mention is the Hillary Institute of International Leadership, um, which is EHF's parent company have um, a, a group of global laureates. They select one laureate per year um, who is always a, um, <coughs> a person who is working in, in their mid-career to, um, to make positive change on a, on a global level. So that's, that's a, a sort of, it's a bit of a Nobel Prize for, for, for change makers. Um, last year's laureate was Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Centre um, this year's laureate has just been announced, um, and she is Megan Fallone from the Barefoot College, which works to um, empower and support um, <coughs> women around around the world, particularly in developing countries, to to start enterprises and to and um, and to learn technology skills. So that's a bit of an overview of our of our ecosystem, which is uh, continually growing. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about um, why New Zealand? Why have we decided to root this program in New Zealand? So we see New Zealand having a lot of the key ingredients of really being a, a strong incubation nation. We have strong um, political rights and civil liberties here, which um, allow you the freedom to, to try things which might not be possible in, in other countries. Um, we're the least corrupt country in, in the world. Um, we continually top that, um, that ranking from Transparency International um, and the second most peaceful country in the world. So things are generally very stable here. We have um, an incredible um, culture nationwide, really. Um, we're a leader in um, indigenous relationships and particularly in, um, in harming some of the, uh, some of the wounds of colonization, which we've seen in, in different westernized countries around the world. We have in New Zealand, uh, the, the foundation of our nation is the Treaty of Waitangi, which was um, a, a treaty signed between the Maori people and the Crown um, back in 1840. And, um, and while there have been some grievances of that, of that uh, treaty, um, the government is going through a process now of um, of repairing and um, and providing settlements um, to help um, you know um, correct some of those those historical grievances. We were the first country in the world to give women the right to vote, uh, so very progressive in that regard, and um, very diverse nation. Um, so Auckland is is as a city is more diverse than. Um, than London or New York or many of the other, the world's other um, sort of large cities. I think it's second only to Vancouver in terms of diversity. Um, very creative here. We're very resourceful because we've been stuck at the bottom of the world away from a lot of other countries for a long time and, um, and generally very happy, open people. And in terms of actually growing businesses and developing businesses here, um, the World Bank has ranked us first in the world for the ease of doing business. Um, placed where we are geographically, we have strong um, trade relations with the, both the East and the West, which makes us um, quite unique in terms of being able to um, work with both. We, we have a great education system here, and so a well-educated um, 
workforce that um, that uh, fellows can tap into. And because, as we said before, we have been, um, you know, geographically isolated for much of our history, um, we've really learned a, um, a fantastic DIY culture um, down here in terms of people um, thinking outside the box and just uh, getting on with it, tinkering in the back shed and, and doing things. So um, we have a, a, a neat story here in that a New Zealander invented the world's first personal jetpack, which I think is making, making some waves. Um, Facebook and, and other big tech companies regularly use New Zealand as, um, as a test market for first adopter um, uh, sort of uh, audiences. As um, we, we, are, we represent a, a small subset of the population that is um, technology savvy and uses a lot of these, um, these tools, uh, but again is just a, is a small compact market where you can quickly test ideas. Um, Google also launched Project Loon in New Zealand, which is their project to uh, provide wireless um, internet from giant weather balloons and to provide that for everybody in the world. So um, that's quite a, quite a neat example too. I'm going to briefly talk through a few um, examples of companies that have really really showcased New Zealand's innovation um, community. Weta Digital is one that a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, they're behind Avatar, um, a lot of the, all of the Lord of the Rings movies, um, King Kong and, and lots of other sort of big Hollywood blockbusters at the moment. Um, so really leading from Wellington there. Zero is um, uh, an accounting software firm which has, um, has really made it big out of New Zealand. Um, they have a multi-billion dollar valuation and they're based again here in Wellington. Lanzatech is a, is a really awesome company who are um, working to capture um, waste industrial gases um, and carbon and to help turn that into um, useful products like aviation fuel. So they've got an exciting uh, project working with Virgin Airlines um, to take yeah, waste, waste gases and essentially be able to um, uh, provide green fuel for airplanes. Rocket Lab is a organization that are um, launching rockets into space from here in New Zealand. And that's, um, that's really cool because it's, uh, it represents a really a growing industry in New Zealand. Um, we have clear open skies over this country, which you perhaps don't get in, um, in, in bigger countries with a lot more flight paths. So there's really a lot of things um, going for, for the development of a, of a thriving space industry here. And we're seeing quite a few hubs around the country popping up in Southland, in the Hawke's Bay, um, of, of space communities that are, um, that are starting to really grow. So Rocket Lab, I think, in the last um, year has launched two or three successful um, rockets into space, and they're starting to look at, um, at um, taking commercial payloads as well. Sunfed Meats is an interesting example of an organisation or a company here in New Zealand that are using plant-based proteins, so uh, pea proteins, to create um, replacement meat products. Um, so much more, I guess, it's producing proteins in a much more environmentally sustainable way than um, traditional agriculture. And in Spiral is a really um, great example of a collaborative network of um, of largely freelancers, entrepreneurs, creatives, um, and, and and change makers who who operate like an, a sort of a, a network, an online community um, of working of people working on um, stuff that matters is what they say. So um, it's um, it's a really interesting example of a of what started out in New Zealand as a small community, but has turned into a somewhat of a transnational um, collective of people who, um, who get membership into the organization and, and are, um, are doing really neat things together. Um, and they work as a, a non-hierarchical um, organization 
kind of community of about 300 people these days. So it's a fascinating model to, to look at how we can achieve things together. I'm going to, at this stage, um, hand over to Andre to tell you a little bit more about the, the kind of qualities that we're looking for in fellows and, um, and how to get involved. Thanks for that, Elena. I appreciate it. Um, just before as well, there are um, a few other pieces I'm, I'm keen to cover. So they don't currently have in slides, so I'll just cover it, off, cover it off verbally. So first is around describing the Global Impact Visa, which those from overseas, uh, if you're accepted into the program, will be eligible to apply for. So first thing to say about it is that it's a super open and permissive visa. Uh, there was a question uh, from one of the, the Q&A um, comments asking around how the visa enables people to, um, to travel to other countries and, and in-person requirements. So it's permissive in the sense that there are no in-country requirements for the visa. You're required to be here for Welcome Week, but beyond that, um, you're able to spend as much time in other parts of the world as you need to. So it's really designed for global citizens. Uh, it also has the option for you to apply for permanent residency after about three years. Um, assuming that you're a continued part of the EHF community. Uh, and there are some steps to apply for it, but it's a lot easier than starting from scratch. So that's, that's a little bit about the Global Impact Visa, which EHF is the, um, the program um, that, that the visa fits with. And the only way to get the visa is to apply for EHF. Uh, so it's a, as Alina mentioned, it's a specifically designed visa to attract people who are doing a high impact work and it uh, fits hand in glove with the EHF community. Just one other piece adding to what Alina mentioned before around, um, around why come to New Zealand and it's a, it's a combination of connecting with our fellows and a, it's, a, it's a great community of people who are doing amazing work, so connecting in with those. Um, the other thing that Alina was sharing around about New Zealand is that it's a, a great place to get things done and it's a small place and you can do stuff at national scale very quickly. So, for example, Rocket Lab, which Elena mentioned, before Rocket Lab, there was, there was no legislation or space industry, but they decided they want to do it from New Zealand. They chatted with the government and built a, um, now we have a space agency and we have an enabling legislative framework. So New Zealand's a place that's open for business and you can create the right um, environment very quickly compared to some other places. Okay, so now, and the other piece to mention actually as well is um, keep the questions coming. Um, I've covered off um, part of one of them now, but um, keep, keep them coming um, and I will we'll come to a bunch of them towards the end as well. I'm going to share a little bit now about our selection criteria. Uh, and there are five that are listed here and you can read more on the link down at the bottom, ehf.org forward slash apply. So the first piece is around people have a bold vision to do work that's going to make a positive impact in the world. Um, so something that is going to address systemic challenges. So something that's going to make a big dent in the universe if it works and, and um, a, a, um, a passion for doing things in a different way um, that are innovative. So that's the first one, a bold vision to solve systemic challenges. The second one is about your ability to deliver on that vision. So big ideas are not enough. You also need um, to be able to demonstrate that you have an ability to actually get things off the ground. And what we'd say on that is we, we try to take a broad sort of lens on how we assess your ability to get things um, done or you know, your ability to deliver on your vision. Um, so we'll be looking, for example, at what you've done with the venture that you're currently working on or in other ventures that you've been involved with as well. Um, and not just traditional startups, but also any other types of Nonprofit work that you've been doing or other work you've been doing in your career. So kind of pulling together the different pieces from your work to try and get a sense of your ability to actually get new things that are going to be um, so going to be solving systemic challenges. The third piece is around building long-term connections with New Zealand. And so there are different ways of doing this. One is to move your, um, your family or your venture to New Zealand. But it's also, EHF is designed so that there are other ways of doing that, as Lena mentioned before. So if you're an investor, you can, um, you know, you can leverage investment capital um, that you're linked to other parts of the world. You can connect New Zealand to your connections um, from wherever 
in the world that you're based or connected to. Um, so there are different ways of connecting with New Zealand. Um, and, and we kind of look at that and identify, you know, what, or ask the question of how meaningful is your connection with New Zealand? What do we see connecting through New Zealand and how will that provide benefit for you and also a benefit for New Zealand? Uh, the fourth selection criteria is around your ability to actively and positively contribute to the EHF community. So we're after people who are going to be great community members, people who are going to be great people to work with, people who are going to be generous um, and actively engaged, and people that we can see ourselves working with over a long period of time. Our fifth selection criteria is, is around being great ambassadors for New Zealand, um, and that involves um, embodying and demonstrating EHF's values. So bold vision, ability to deliver on it. You can, you can do work through New Zealand and connect with New Zealand over the long term. Um, and you can contribute to the community and you'll be a good ambassador. Um, on that long-term connection to New Zealand piece as well, actually just adding to that. So uh, we recognize that for some people, they're not ready to move everything to New Zealand straight away. Sometimes it can take a little bit of time and um, different people's circumstances will, will affect what that looks like for them. So we're open to looking, what, looking at what that looks like in your situation and trying to figure out um, you know, how that works. The other thing we'd say about the selection criteria is it's not just a tick box exercise of, oh, yep, do they, you know, have they met, um, have they kind of met some level of it? It's, it's looking, I guess, kind of at um, shades of gray in the sense that, you know, how, if you have a bold vision, you know, how bold is it or how, what kind of impact, what kind of level of impact is it going to make in the world? If you're able to deliver on a vision, like what kind of level of ability to deliver do you bring? Um, so it's not just black and white tick box. It's more like a group. Um, more like a scale of, of you know, what, to what level of strength do you give to that particular criteria. But also it's not just, it's not just a tick, tick box exercise. We're looking at how the different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit together. So like, um, you know, how does your, your application as a whole across those five criteria, how does that look? How does that cohere? Does that, does that make sense? Okay, now we're going to cover how to get involved. So this is talking a little bit about how to apply for EHF. Key dates. Okay, so applications are now open for our fourth cohort. The early bird deadline is on the 1st of August. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Then, um, And the, the early bird deadline gives you a discount to our application fees. So that's the reason for getting in before the 1st of August. The next step is our, um, our final deadline for any cohort four applications are due by the 2nd of September. And every six months we have a, you know, roughly every six months we have a new cohort. So if, you're, if you apply after, um, you know, if you don't get in by 2 September, then, um, then it would make sense for you if you wanted to, to apply for cohort five or another cohort. Then once we've accepted all applications, we crank into our selection process. And um, in the next slide, I'll cover that off in a little bit more detail. But broadly, it goes from September through to November. Then in probably be late November, possibly even very early December, we will let people know whether they've been accepted into EHF. And for some people, we might be able to give some, um, some guidance on that earlier in the selection process. Uh, but definitely by end of November, possibly very early December, we will have decided who is offered a place in the fellowship. And then for those who are internationals, the next step for you is to apply for a global impact visa. And you apply for a global impact visa from Immigration New Zealand. And um, they, we look at kind of different things. So uh, at EHF, we're looking at the selection criteria I mentioned before. Um, the the Immigration NZ, they'll be looking, um, you can see more on Immigration NZ's website, by the way, in terms of their criteria, but they'll be looking for things like character in terms of police checks. They'll be looking for things like your health. Um, and you can, as I mentioned, learn more on the website. Then the idea is that people would have, uh, internationals would have their global impact visas uh, processed and hopefully awarded um, in time for the, um, the welcome week. Um, in March next year and then after that the fellowship begins and that goes on for a bunch of time and as we mentioned um, there is the option after three years to apply for permanent residency. A bit more about the selection process so 
first step is to apply online and you can go to ehf.org forward slash apply and go and um, submit your online application. So we ex we've actually simplified it since prior cohorts. So we hope that it's um, easier and clearer and um, simpler than ever. It might take around half an hour, um, at, a, at least half an hour to, um, to do. And um, it involves answering some questions about yourself. It involves submitting a video um, that's an optional but highly recommended um, question, um, as well as providing a bit of demographic info. Then, once you've applied online, we do a bunch of interviewing of candidates. We often do a short interview um, for some and then, a, and then a longer one, and we interview references for those who are shortlisted for that as well. Then, once the EHF team has done all our work in terms of reviewing applications and, and um, videoing and reference checks, we then um, put forward a final shortlist to our independent selection panel. Uh, and they're independent from the EHF team. They, they're the ones that make the final decision about if anyone should be offered a place in the EHF fellowship. So reminder of key dates, early bird applications close the 1st of August, so a couple of weeks away. And then on the 2nd of September is the final deadline for cohort four applications. And Welcome Week is in early March next year. Uh, and that's in Wellington, New Zealand as well. <clears throat> How do you apply? There's the link ehf.org forward slash apply. Um, you, a bunch of you have already connected uh, on our website. Um, in terms of fees, so there are different prices depending on your circumstances. So if you're an international entrepreneur, their price is 600 New Zealand dollars plus 400 per additional team member who's also applying for EHF. And if you're applying as an investor, the price is 1,100 New Zealand dollars. There are scholarships available until the 1st of August, August rather. Um, and if you go to ehf.org forward slash apply, there'll be a scholarship application form there. They're need based. And the idea there is that um, for people in particular economic need, we can, um, we can have a reduced cost option. There's also a discount for New Zealanders as well. We should also point out, I think, that these, uh, these are initial application fees. Um, I think I just want to check with you, Andre, and that there, yeah. there, are, um, there are additional application acceptance fees that are payable um, only if you are uh, accepted into the Admittability Fellowship. Um, so this makes it a bit more accessible up front um, for, for people to apply, and then, um, and then additional fees are, are paid by those who actually are successful in getting into the program. That's correct. And those additional fees are only for those who are international investors and entrepreneurs as well. So um, those who have a scholarship have a less, uh, a lower um, fee if, they're, if they accept their offer in the fellowship and Kiwis have no, no additional fee at that point. Okay, let's pass it over for questions. Um, so maybe we just go from the top. So question from Janald is um, your idea is something you've been working on for about three years. Um, I would consider a pivot that's trying to solve the same grand problem, but taking a radically different approach. Does it make it too early for you to apply? So what I'd mention there is, and maybe it's covered off in terms of our selection criteria. So um, another key thing which I didn't mention was we focus on the person rather than the, rather than the venture. So we're looking at your ability as an entrepreneur. We're not just testing business plans. Uh, we obviously learn about people's ability as an entrepreneur through the progress that you've made or what you plan to do or, or how you're thinking about it or what you've done in the past. But we're primarily focused on what kind of potential as an entrepreneur or in terms of this part of our selection process, we focus on your potential as an entrepreneur rather than just what do we think about this venture. Um, albeit that there's the connection between the two. So, so there's no, not necessarily a black and white rule around whether you're too early. What I'd say is the more that you can show your, your track record as an entrepreneur, that will, um, that will help us um, have confidence in that area. Uh, but there are different ways to do that. If you have an established track record, then we can look at that. And we, um, if your new venture is, um, has less progress, then, um, then we will have more confidence from previous ventures of your entrepreneurial capability. Next up, someone says they have no venture now, but they have some ideas. Would it be a good idea to apply as an entrepreneur or investor? So 
it really depends on how you will, um, you know, what you'll do. If you're someone who's going to be building a venture and that's your primary reason for, you know, primary thing you'd be doing is to build a new venture, um, whether that be an NGO or a movement or a company, then that's an entrepreneur. If you're primarily someone who's going to help support others um, through mentoring and through putting in money, then that's an investor. So it's not so much based on the idea stage that you're at, it's more based on um, what you'll be doing. Then another question is, how mature an idea must be to be eligible for the program? Um, we've, I think I've kind of covered that off a lot in the second to last question. And how mature an initiative must it be? Um, so it's based on entrepreneurial potential. So, um, you know, if you've knocked something out of the park, then that shows your potential. Um, if you have, yeah, if you've knocked, if you've done things in the past that we can look at, then, um, then that gives us confidence. So it's not just the current venture is the, the short answer. And next question is, I saw there's also, there are work rights. Um, so if we wish to live in New Zealand and the startup has no capital, we can work, say, 20 hours a week to afford food and rent and then throw ourselves into the project the rest of our spare time. So the visa does allow people to work in New Zealand. It enables you to invest and it enables you to start up or to bring a new venture to New Zealand. Um, it's primarily, it's not primarily designed towards people who are just plan to um, take a job, but um, for some people, given their circumstances, if that's going to help support your venture, albeit, you know, providing an income, um, the, uh, or providing contacts that will help support you, then that would look at that in the broader sort of context of your entrepreneurial potential and how that's going to help you achieve what you want to get done in New Zealand. Next question is about, do we need to present a complete feasibility study of the idea to EAGF? Um, so over to you, I guess, to figure out how best to answer our questions. So as I mentioned before, it's more focused on the person rather than just the venture. So we're not, we're not um, just looking at business plans as our primary or sole lens. So I think that answers it. I mean, if you have, the more you have evidence that you can concisely communicate to us that shows the opportunity of, of your idea, then that's fantastic. Um, in the selection process, are the most attractive projects slash concepts leveraging off Competitive advantages in New Zealand, for example, Rocket Lab taking advantages of the open skies above NZ. So we're open to people doing all sorts of different stuff. Uh, so it's not just that we're looking at, oh, you know, here are the, here are, you know, here are like whatever, three or four or five or whatever it is, key industries, and we will only support people doing this. It's more, we, we're going to support great entrepreneurs um, who are, you know, going to fit, be great representatives for EHF and NZ and be great cohort members. We'll, those are the people that we want. And then um, when we look at how will they connect with New Zealand, we'll get a sense of, uh, of how your work might actually, um, you know, what that might look like on the ground. Um, so, but if you're doing something that, hasn't, that has very little connection with New Zealand, then we might ask the question, how does, um, you know, how will it actually work here? Is that practical for you to do it from New Zealand? Um, Elena, do you want to cover off the question about mentoring or I can cover that off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, during, the, during the welcome retreats, um, it's very much a participant-driven process. So if people were requesting uh, mentorship or training on certain um, elements of, of business or, um, or storytelling or raising investment or, or whatever the case may be, um, we would look at... Um, seeing if there is somebody within the fellow cohort who could um, run a workshop. Um, we, can, we can also connect on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well. So um, I, I wouldn't say there's, there's formal training that our team runs in those areas, uh, but what we do is, is very much a, a crowdsourced plan for the week. So we find out what are the questions that people have, um, what are the skills that we have within the group, and, um, and who would be willing to run a skill sharing session um, to be able to um, impart that knowledge with others in the group. Thanks, Elena. I'm going to jump into a bunch of the next ones because they're linked to selection. Um, we've got a bunch of them, so I'll just cover them off as quickly as I can. So the question is, can you apply as a team with one international and two New Zealanders? So the short answer is yes. Uh, and you would apply as an international um, at the international rates rather than as in the Kiwi rates, given that there's an international 
involved there. Next question, how much time should every team member be available in order to con contribute with EHF? Would part-time, full-time, or specific hours in a week? Um, so, um, so I guess I, I assume that you're answering ar asking around um, contribute to their project. Um, so, I mean, we'll look at it in the context of the project and saying what does this need to get off the ground? Um, so if, if, if you're trying to do a, a world-changing idea and all of you are only working three, day, three hours a week and we don't see that changing, then that could be a problem. But if, if, um, if we see a transition towards being able to actively engage with your project, and it depends on the project. So it's more of a case-by-case -case sort of basis. But um, you know, in general, the more you can spend energy working on a difficult problem, the, the better. But um, we recognize that it can take, um, you, know, you have to get resources from other places. So it's you know, context-specific. Next question, are there any other benefit of applying in the early bird category beyond the discount? So short answer is no. So um, um, next question, is there a limit to number of members you can apply as? I'd like to apply as one Kiwi, three non-NZ non, um, How do you apply? So short answer is one application per team. Um, and there, you know, we ask you for details of your different team members in there. Um, just running through the last part of that. Um, so yeah, to your question around payments, you'd pay at the international rate if you have a mixture of Kiwis and, and internationals. If you'd like to take your wife with you, would there be a problem and would EHF help assist? So how it works is people who are fellows get access to the Global Impact Visa. People who are um, partners of visas or family of visas can get partner visas um, is the short one. So um, if you are working in a team, you could um, both apply if you know if that if that fitted, um, but otherwise applying for a partner visa. Um, next question: If you want to apply as an investor, are there a specific amount of money that you have to have invested? For example, you're interested in carbon forestry. Can you apply as an investor to invest in carbon forestry projects? Um, so. The way we look at it is in terms of those selection criteria that, that we mentioned before. So they're both for investors and for entrepreneurs. Um, and um, so it's not, we don't just look at, you know, how much money do you have? And it's, you know, this person's got more money than that person. So we'll, we'll invest in, you know, we'll, we'll accept them. It's more based on your ability to create large impact. And if you're applying as an investor, if you've got access to investment capital, then um, that helps you to support ventures. So that's a positive thing, but it's, it's looking within the, the context of the impact that you can help enable. Um, so if you're able to add value through, um, through your contacts and through your experience um, to help companies grow beyond just the money that you bring, then, then that's certainly very important to us. Next question is, could you explain a little bit more regarding investors application criteria? So I think I've covered that off, so it's the same. Um, next question, you're a UK citizen, business partners are Kiwi. We've covered that off, so you'd apply as an international team. Next question, doing an agricultural product with a project with a Japanese company for global impact. One of the team members applied for cohort three and was denied. Do we have a better chance this time? So I don't know if you have a better chance. It just depends on your circumstances, right? Um, so, you know, um, we're, we're still in the process of giving feedback to those who applied for cohort three who um, were not included. So um, you should get an email from me of the next little bit of feedback. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Be looking at, you know, what kind of progress you and your team have made. And if the team changes, then that might affect the, um, the um, ability of the, or the uh, our sense of fit um, with the program, just cause you know, um, different people um, bring together different, different skills and capabilities. Next question with a primary interest in globe and in global change making face to face and local collaboration is important. Uh, how would you illustrate New Zealand's culture for collaboration is particularly different between different places of the world? Um, do the application fees include the cost of immigration fees? So I'll answer the last one first. Um, so um, it doesn't include the cost of immigration fees, from what, uh, and they vary by different country. For a number of countries, the cost of applying for the Global Impact Visa from Immigration New Zealand is relatively small. For some, they're free, um, but, it, but it is worth you looking at what it will cost, and there's a calculator there that, that will tell you how much it costs for your circumstances given the country that you're applying from or you know your current country of citizenship in terms of collaboration in New Zealand it's probably more similar to Western countries what I'd say about New Zealand is it's a small close-knit 
close knit place. So people are open to um, meeting up and to talking and collaborating. So a lot of business gets done over a cup of coffee. Um, and I've found people to be very approachable and willing to spend some time to, um, to connect compared to um, different parts of the world that I've been in as well. Next question, is there any database of Kiwi startups to initiate contact for this EHF application? Um, so, uh, I mean, we're connected with different startups. We don't have a database as such, but there are different networks that we collaborate with that, um, um, that can, can access um, and, and you know, help point you in the right direction. So it's more personally tailored rather than just, here's the database. Uh, but there is actually a directory of Kiwi startups. It's called Rebel, um, but I'm not sure how up-to-date it is. If your past business track is good, but difficult to prove, um, not on go global scaled and your present business plan on plastic recycling is promising then. Um, so we'd need, to, we'd need to look into it. Um, so it's hard to answer in the abstract. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at, as I mentioned before, um, looking at your current as well as what you've done um, prior to get a sense of your entrepreneurial potential. Next question. Why would it be important for a Kiwi partner to also apply for EHF fellowship? Um, so, I mean, that's up to the people that are applying, right? But um, if you had, um, so, and it's definitely not necessary that you would have a Kiwi um, partner. Like most of our applications are either all Kiwis or, or international, but we could conceivably have a mixture. Um, and um, so it really depends on the project that you're doing, right? Um, like if you have, if you have been collaborating for a while and you have different capabilities and skills and that, that you bring together and you happen to be from different countries, um, then that's fantastic. Or if that helps you do your work, then that, um, yeah, then that's fantastic in terms of your ability to get things off the ground. But it's definitely not a prerequisite and we'd look at it on a case by case basis. Next question, could you give a few highlights as to why the acceptance rate is relatively low? What are common mistakes or problems or weaknesses that applicants did? Um, so basic, so we have a, um, you know, we set, as I mentioned before, our selection criteria, it's not based on just, you know, um, you know, have they got a bold idea, yes or no? It's based on degrees and extent, like, you know, how world-changing is it or how strong is their capability, demonstrated capability? Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess we look at it in the context of wanting to build a community of people um, with, you know, with a high bar in terms of entrepreneurial capability. But we're, um, we, we're open to looking at that in different sort of ways. Common mistakes, I'd say just um, being clear in how you communicate is one piece. Um, I'd say that um, just focusing on those selection criteria and having a think through what that looks like in your, in your circumstances and how you can put your best foot forward. I mean, that's really up to you um, in terms of, you know, for your circumstances, what, um, you know, how would you best communicate it? Um, and how can you give, I guess, how can you give evidence that would, um, that would help um, not just be, you know, here's what I'm saying, but, you know, what's, What's evidence that would be able to demonstrate, you know, show rather than just tell? Questions around references. What type of references are we after? Um, so for those who are shortlisted, we'll follow up for references. So you don't have to provide references when you first apply. Some people submit reference letters, uh, you know, letters of recommendation. That's, um, you know, you're more than welcome to do that. But in terms of um, references, you don't have to give all the details right from the get-go. Uh, if we're going to ask for references, we'll provide a bit more guidance, but it's, um, broadly, it's people that you've been working with or people that can provide a character reference. Next question. Why would it be important for a Kiwi Venture co-founder to also apply for EHF Fellowship? I've covered that one off already. Next question. Our previous living slash working experience in Australia could be considered similar to New Zealand exposure. Um, it kind of depends on the context, right? Um, um, so I'd need to have more context probably to that to be able to provide a good answer. I mean, <laughs> all our SQL New Zealand and Australia have some similarities, but in terms of um, what I'd suggest is go back to our selection criteria and have a look through that, answer it in that lens. Um, next up, I've been following EHF for a while. I'd like to apply, but before that, is there a person who can meet um, so you can clear a few of your doubts before you're applying? Currently live in Wellington. So maybe... Um, I mean, these webinars are one opportunity for that, I guess. Uh, you can send an email to us at applications at ehf.org. I mean, that's probably a good way to cover off your questions. If there are specific ones that are uh, not covered off by what we've got to so far. You mentioned about additional fees after acceptance. Could you tell a bit more about the price structure? 
Yeah, so um, broadly speaking, it's, so it's for internationals rather than Kiwis, and it's, um, there are discounts for those who are able to get a, a, um, a scholarship. Probably the best thing to do is to look through um, the actual website, so ehf.org or rather forward slash apply, and you can see it there and you can look through. It's probably better for you to, um, to read through the table because there are different prices for, um, depending on where, what type of application you make. Next up, is there any barriers for Muslim people slash women who may participate in EHF? So um, the short answer to that is that we want to have an open and inclusive community. So we want to be open to people from all sorts of religions um, and all sorts of different backgrounds. So we don't want to um, negatively discriminate against people because of their gender or because of their um, religion or because of their sexual orientation. Um, so we want to have an equal opportunities um, selection process. Next question, the um, 36,000 mentioned New Zealand dollars is the financial requirement in the Global Impact Visa website is per person or per application. Um, that's a really good question. I can follow up with you on that. My, my guess is that would be per, per person. Um, yeah, it would be actually because people apply for Global Impact Visas um, as, as individuals once you've, if you've been accepted. Um, so that would be per person, but it's, um, and the broad idea there is that New Zealand government wants to have some sort of clarity that people will be able to financially sustain themselves. And that's either through the, the assets that you can bring. So, you know, stuff, m money in the bank or shares or whatever financial assets you have. Um, but also you can achieve that through working as well. So you don't need to have $36,000 New Zealand in the bank. You just need the ability to um, generate that sort of amount over a year of, um, of your first year of being in New Zealand. So believe it or not, actually, I was going to say last questions we've covered, but one more come in and do keep them coming. We've got another three minutes to go. Bit of a question marathon here at the webinar. Um, okay, next question is, please clarify again with immigration. I think it's per visa. I, I, I see what you mean in terms of if you have multiple visas. Um, I, I'd need to check that is the short answer. If you send an email to applications at EHF, dot org um, then we'll be able to cover that off we have another couple of minutes questions keep coming through <laughs> thanks for the someone says good good pace I'd like to keep it keep it ticking along <laughs> um, keep them coming faster so we can answer them faster <laughs> we've got two minutes to go <laughs> um, last question so notice that the global impact visa are allowing a quota of 400 people over four years, I approximately 100 per year. Um, thought EHF had selected only 30 with a plan to select probably 60 this year. Okay, so it's a good question. So the maximum that EHF can select in a, in a year um, for people, internationals who get a global impact visa is 100. So call that 50 per cohort and we have space for Kiwis on top of that as well. But um, we, that's a maximum rather than a target. So for us, it's based on um, based on the selection criteria. How many people do we have? Do we have um, a sense have a strong fit with the program who would make great fellows? So that's our core lens. If that um, if we have fifty international fellows, that's fantastic. If we have a smaller number than that, that then that's okay too. It's more based for us. It's based on um, getting a good sense of fit rather than just kind of filling a, a quota. Could you inform about the additional costs after acceptance? For example principal application oh, yeah. so the additional the additional fee is for um, for those who are applying for the global impact visa um, in terms of EHF's um, fees on acceptance so so for example if you applied in a team of two people and they each had two family members beyond that uh, the two people that are applying for the global impact visa would be the ones that would pay the additional fees um, fees it's not based on um, family members or other team members who are not applying for a global impact visa are there certain limitations on, for the expansion of EHF? Um, so, I mean, at, at this stage, we've got the, you know, 100 global impact visas per year. Um, that's, that's our current sort of run rate um, maximum capacity um, at this stage, but um, yeah. Our, so our pilot period is for four years at this point with the New Zealand government. Um, so it's, um, we're hoping very much to be able to extend beyond then, um, but it will depend on the success of the program over the next couple of years. And last question um, asks to email the, the Q&A script. So um, we can't actually send the, the like text script, but what we'll do is we'll post a video. 
And last question, if you get selected, who's going to pay the airfare and accommodation for induction week? So that's a good question. So that is paid by the, um, that's paid at your end rather than EHF's end. Um, there's no direct cost for attending Welcome Week in terms of accommodation and food and those kind of things. But in terms of you, um, for the period of Welcome Week and, um, and the New Frontiers Summit, so that's a, you know, that's a week in length. But if you're going to come to New Zealand for four weeks, then you need to pay for your additional accommodation and food beyond the, beyond the Welcome Week. Uh, and obviously, um, you need to pay for your transport to make your way to New Zealand. Uh, last question, and we need to wrap it up. Can you access this webinar and Q&A where? So I'm going to post, um, as I mentioned at the start, we've been recording this call. Um, and then tomorrow, you get, you'll get an email from Zoom saying, um, you know, um, thanks for the webinar, but also we'll have a link to the video from it as well. So you better have a look back through. Yeah, that will be on our YouTube channel where you can you can learn a lot more about the program. We've got a bunch of videos on there as well. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for making the time. Um, and it's been great to connect. So thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.